Okay, shall we? Yeah. We are continuing our study of the Gemara, Masechet Megillah, page 14a. Now, today, tonight's subject is going to be a little bit uh, off the beaten path of Purim. We're not talking about the Megillah tonight. In fact, we're not even talking about the figures, the characters in the Megillah. There's no Queen Esther, there's no Mordechai. We're not even talking about that era. It's... it's uh, <laughs> Tonight is a totally tangential discussion. But it evolves out of something that was related to Megillah. And because it evolves out of something related, if you understand the style of the Talmud, we kind of meander like life itself. Okay, so let's do it. The statement that was made was that the ring, the passing of the ring from Achashverosh to Haman, to Haman, was more powerful than... 48 prophets. They said 48 prophets preached and taught, cajoled, inspired, begged, uplifted, criticized. They didn't have nearly the kind of effect as Ahasuerus did when he pulled that ring off his finger and empowered Haman to set in motion a plan of genocide <coughs> against the Jewish people. Okay, we talked about this. We talked about the idea of the ring. Why the Gemara casts it or frames it that way. From there we got into a general discussion of the holiday of Purim, the establishment of a day of rejoicing for posterity, where that comes from, and we talked about singing the hollow. And the distinction between Purim and miracles prior. At this point, the Gemara returns to the statement that was made before. And the statement that was made which I elaborated on very, very briefly, and here's the source of it, and here's where we're really going to understand it properly. The Gemara says, V'suleka. <laughs> so the Gemara says, V'suleka. <laughs> it's as if the conversation just continued. We happen to be like discussing a whole bunch of other things, and for us there was a couple of weeks in between. <laughs> The Gemara doesn't go back to the original uh, statement. The Gemara just says, V'su leka. That's it? No, nobody else? <laughs> You're supposed to understand. And remember that the Gemara made a statement before about 48 prophets. And the Gemara's query is, 48 prophets? That's all? That's all the Jewish people ever boasted was 48 prophets? Baksiv, how could you say that? It's written, and here... We talk about the very first verse in the book of Samuel, Shmuel Aleph, Pedek Aleph, Pasek Aleph. So the very first verse introduces us to the father of Shmuel Hanavi, the husband of Chana, the great heroine who teaches us how to pray. And his name is Alkana. But when the Torah introduces us to Alkana, the Torah says, Vayihi ish echad. So there was this man. The first one talk about echad, echad um yuchad. He was an exceptional man. He was a man. And he was min haromasayim tseifim. He came from, and the Gemara, the, the, the scripture just lists a place. The place is romasayim tseifim. So the Gemara says about this place called romasayim tseifim. That it is a euphemism. It's not just a place. And the, the euphemism is Echod Mimosayim Tsoifim. That there were, he was one of 200 viewers, 200 seers. So, how do we expound? How did the Gemara get there? <laughs> how did the Gemara get from a Pasuk? Bahi Ish Echod Minharam Mosayim Tsoifim that he was not Echad from Ramasayim Tzayfim, but he was Echad of Ramasayim, which is a place, which means Reish or Masayim, and Reish is 200 and, and Gematria says Maharsha, and Masayim is 200. So Ramasayim is Reish, Masayim, 200. Tzayfim of those who can view. And we'll soon see why Tzayfim, why that means prophets. So the Maharsha says that what even though the Gemara usually would explain a, a, a limud when to 
develop an idea or explain something, usually the Gemara would explain it. But the Gemara doesn't really explain it here. The Gemara, the Masha says that the issue here is that most of the time when we talk about Shmuel Hanavi's parents, they come from Ramosa. Like in modern Hebrew, you have these hills outside Jerusalem that are known as Ramot. So he it was on a hill, and the hill in the territory of Ephraim, they're from the tribe of Ephraim, is Isha Farasi, the Pasuk says. And there, on a hilltop, was this hilltop settlement. So the name is Ramasa. The name is Rama. Rama is Ram. High. A high place. A high, tall hill. So if he, he comes to a place called Rama or, 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 or Ramasa, so why does it say Ramasaim? And because it's plural, that seems to be telling us more than simply the name of a place, but it's telling us about the place, about the citizenry, about the inhabitants. Never the Masha says that the idea of Ramasaim is Lashon Rabim, not Ramasa. And therefore, our sages expounded that Ramasaim alludes to Masayim. The Resh is 200, and Masayim, well, Masayim could mean 200 with a few minus the Aleph, or the notion of Rama, the high place that had a Resh in it, Resh Tseifim, that had 100, 200 viewers. Which these are Echad bin Masayim. He was one of 200 viewers, or 200 lookouts. Shenisnabu lahem li Yisrael, who delivered prophecy for the Jewish people. Now before we go further, I want to just uh, talk to you about uh, the word Tseifim. So we, we, Tseifim became viewers. Uh, how, do we, how, how is that a prophet? And why is a prophet called a Tsofa, called a viewer? So actually, in the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel, the first six verses open with this very interesting description of the purpose of a sentry, a lookout. So, so the, pasig, the, the, the verse begins, God, the word of God comes to Ezekiel. And what does it say? God talks to Ezekiel, says, Ben Adam, hey, human being, speak to your people and tell them that I'm going to bring sword to the land. And then he starts talking about the notion of a lookout and a lookout's job. That the lookout's job, if a sword, which means a euphemism for uh, a, a military, which comes with baleful intent, that if, if, if there's going to be a, a, a militaristic attack or there's some kind of force which is coming, a, a, an, an armed force, so then there's going to be a sentry. And the sentry is going to have the ability to sound the alarm, which in the scripture is described as the sounding of a shofar. And he's going to sound the shofar, and in this way he's going to warn the inhabitants of the city that an attack is on the way. And everybody who's going to pay attention is going to be able to take precautions. But if you don't pay attention, you won't be able to defend yourself. So the job of the prophet, uh, pardon me, the job of the sentry is to sound the alarm, proverbially, or blow the shofar, as it is in the scriptural parlance. And, and then he goes on to say, the one who will not heed the sound of the shofar will be guilty for his or her own demise because they should have listened when the alarm was sounded. And the sentry, he can see because he, he's high up. He can see from far away. But the sentry who doesn't sound the alarm and doesn't warn the people, then the sentry is guilty. And the sentry will be responsible for the loss of life that ensues. Okay. It's very interesting about early warning systems and the job of the sentry, the people who man the early warning system. And then in verse 7, the prophecy says, Va'ata ben Adam tsoife nesaticha leves Yisrael. You, as a prophet, were placed as a sentry for the Jewish people. So that tsoife means a lookout. And you had a lookout for the Jewish people. Vishamata mipi. You have the ability to see far away. Not because you can see, but because I'm telling you. You're like the sentry. You're like the lookout. You're like the person who's positioned to see the things nobody else can see to sound the alarm. And you're supposed to pass on the warning. You're supposed to sound the alarm for everybody. The Mitzudah's David says, Tseifa nesaticha, I placed you as a lookout. Nasati oischa lihiyes ketseifa liyisrael. I placed you as a lookout, a sentry for the Jewish people. V'chashar tishma. When you hear from me the bad news, the things which are going to be coming against the Jewish people, pass the warning on, Bishmi in my name. 
Okay, so now we have this fascinating idea of what a prophet is. The prophet's job is to get the message and pass on the message to the people or sound the alarm. The prophet is positioned to see things or know things that nobody else can know because he has vision. And because he has that vision, he has a duty. He has a responsibility. His responsibility is towards the people. So the prophet who receives a message for the people but chooses not to sound the alarm because he doesn't want to be unpopular, well, that prophet is, is essentially undermining his very purpose. He's, he's not fulfilling the mission he was given. That's treason. And the people who don't want to listen to the prophet will be guilty because they didn't listen to the prophet. The prophet will not have to take responsibility. The prophet has to do his or her best, namely, to sound the alarm, to send the message out. And we have to hope that people will listen. So this is the way Ezekiel introduces the concept of prophecy. And because Ezekiel introduces the notion of prophecy, it seems that this, there's a cross-reference between the, the way the Talmud, the way the Gemara explains the opening verse of the book of Shmuel, of Samuel, and the way the Tzofa becomes the paradigm or the parable for the prophet later on as described in the book of Ezekiel, of, say, in, the, in the Nevuas of Yechezkel. So going back now to the actual text of our Gemara, the Gemara says that Ramasayim Tzoyfim means there was Reish or Masayim. There was 200 centuries, lookouts, viewers, people who had vision. Who had vision. They were Tzoyfim. They had vision. Vision that nobody else had. And Shmuel's father, Akana, was one of 200. One of 200. That was just in his time. So how could the Gemara make a statement that there were 48 prophets and that the ringing of Haman was, was more effective than the alarms sounded by 48 prophets? There's a clear teaching based off the first verse in the book of Shmuel which suggests that there's in the time of Shmuel, Shmuel's father was one of 200. And you're telling me only 48 people had the ability to ring the alarm or to raise to sound the alarm and that therefore Ahasuerus' act of passing the ring was more meaningful than 48? Where'd you get the number from? And the Gemara says something very interesting. So, I mean, the question is a big question. So the Gemara says indeed, Mehave Tuva. It's true. You're right, there were many. There were many. The Gemara says we never claimed there weren't many prophets. You're throwing the number 200 at you? <laughs> the Gemara says, let me throw a number at you. Kidatanya. We know this because there's a Braisa, which is from the genre of the Mishnah itself. And the, and the Braisa says, Harbe Nevi'im Omdu Lahem Liyisrael. There were many, many prophets that rose for the Jewish people. How many? How many prophets rose for the Jewish people? The Braisa says, Kiflayim ki Mitzrayim. Twice as many as left Egypt in the time of the Exodus. How many people left Egypt in the time of the Exodus? So the numbers that we're given are 600,000. Twice as many as 1.2 million. Does it refer to the 600,000 or does it refer to the, more, the number which is closer to 3 million? Because 600,000 was only males and that was only for 20 to 60. Even Moshe and Aaron weren't counted. So you automatically have 1.2 million and that's just people who are between the age of 20 and 60. And all the children, which was the largest segment of the population. You have to add at least another million. And then you have all the older people and people living for many decades in those days. Into, well into the second century. You're ending up with close to 3 million people. So whether this means there were 6 million prophets or 1.2 million prophets, I don't know. And nobody really has the answer with full clarity. But here's the point. We're talking about millions of people who once had prophecy. It wasn't so uncommon. It wasn't so uncommon once upon a time for people to have prophecy. So the question is not about 200. The Gemara started off with the question, you said 48... We have indications that there were, in fact, 200. The Gemara says, no, no, no. Don't, don't even try with those numbers. 
we know that there were many prophets. Miha, Mihavel, Tuva. There were many, many more. Many more than 200. And that was only in the time of Elkanah. And that was only in the town of Ramah, of the two hills, of the hilltops in, in Ephraim, at the time of Shmuel and of his father, of Elkanah. Then there was 200 prophets in that area of Eretz Yisrael. For all we know, there could have been tens of thousands of prophets. In that town, there were 200 prophets. So in that case comes the big question. So in that case, why, why, why do we say only 48? Indeed, this is very strange. So the Gemara says, Ella, the thing is this. The prophecies that were relevant, meaningful for posterity, those, those were written down and preserved. The prophecies for which there was no permanent need, so they weren't written down. They served their purpose at the time. And that's it. They didn't have to go any further. The Gemara now, after having said this, is going to move on and bring other interpretations within the area of this Pasuk. Other interpretations of the notion of Ramois and Soifois and how else we can interpret the, 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 the verse. So here's the thing. From the very fact that there are multiple ways of elaborating on and developing the full notion, the full idea that is contained in this verse, it's clear that the verse is more than face value. That's without a question. But of course, the Torah is kifaitzitz yifatzitz selo, like a, like a giant hammer that smashes a stone and sparks fly. In the Torah, there's many, many truths, and all of these things are encoded into it. So if you want to talk about prophecy, yes, there's no doubt that that's an indication of 200 prophets living in a particular place in Israel in a particular time. And then we're talking about the idea of millions of prophets, at least 1.2 million prophets, that lived over the course of a very long period of time. Now, the Marsha says that this, this, the, the, the Gemara may mean in the time of Elkanah, there was only 200 prophets. But then in other times, there were many, many more prophets. But this is not clear. Others maintain that the, uh, this amount of prophets was only in the time of Elio Hanavi. Only then was there this amount of prophets. And actually, there were more, more than, than this amount of prophets. At any rate, there were many, many prophets. And these prophets are outside of the 48, the number given, because only 48 prophets and prophetesses have an actual permanent message which is relevant today as it was yesterday and the day after. We'll take a look in Rashi. Rashi says, Vesu leka, neviim, there are no other prophets. And he says, Nevua No, the number 48 is the prophecies that were needed only for generations. Says Rashi, either lilmaid tshuva, either when we study these psukim, it brings us to a sense of contrite regret for the past and resolve for the future, entering us into a state of spiritual rehabilitation or return to Hashem. Or there's a lesson. There's an, a, a message. There's a part of the Torah that wasn't fully clearly understood. And only when we have that prophecy, that's when we're able to appreciate its message and it's relevant for generations. I'm just thinking of an example. Everybody begins the day with Modani Lefanecha. Where do we get to the idea of Modani? So it's actually part of the prophecies that are found in the Book of Lamentations. It says, Chadoshim Labkarim, Rabbi Munasecha. And based on the idea of Chadoshim Labkarim, that God refreshes things each morning, great is your, is your faithfulness, based on this we say, Maidani Lefanecha. <laughs> In other words, the idea of Maidani Lefanecha is something that we don't know from the actual scripture itself, that we should start a day recognizing the fact that God has given us our life, restored our soul to us, and we should be thankful and acknowledge His faithfulness this is something which only shows up as a detail in one of the later prophets, in one of the later prophecies. And we believe that all of the details in the prophecies, all of what they call our, the Jewish Bible or our Tanakh, is prophetically ordained. And all of those prophecies 
are relevant and meaningful. And all of them have to be studied and expounded on and appreciated and understood in order for us to make our way through life. Now when Mashiach will come, it says that all of these later books of prophecies will fade away with the exception of the book of Esther. And this is a a very interesting discussion in and of itself. According to one verse of the Talmud, it says all holidays will fade away. According to another version in the Al Shemoni, which is what the Rambam brings down in Halacha, all books, all the books of the prophets will fade away with the exception of the book of Esther. It's a parallel teaching, not exactly the same. The point then will be this. When Mashiach will come, we will have such clarity, we won't need the later prophecies to illuminate the message of the Torah because we will know the message of the Torah organically. We'll look at the Torah, we'll see exactly what the Torah is saying, like, like the lights are on in this room. You can see exactly where everything is because the lights are on. But if the lights were off, you'd need a flashlight. And if you wouldn't have a flashlight, you'd, you'd have to literally tap your way around, try to figure out where you're going. So we don't have the lights on, and because we didn't have the lights on, and didn't have full clarity or appreciation of Torah Moshe, the 613 mitzvahs that are found in the teachings, in the prophecies of Moshe Rabbeinu, and what they call the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. So because we didn't have that clarity, and we needed greater clarity, Hashem gave us that clarity through these 48 prophets and, and their prophecies. Which is to say, not all of their prophecies, the prophecies that were relevant for posterity, those are the ones that were recorded. The prophecies that weren't relevant for posterity, they weren't recorded. We have a story with Saul, Saul the, the, the king, and Shaul HaMelech is looking for his donkeys. And he meets some girls and he has a giggly conversation with them. And then they go on to, to the prophet. Now, did he tell him where the donkeys are? I don't know. Where were the donkeys? It doesn't make a difference. That's not relevant. The story with the donkeys and the girls is relevant. How and why is it relevant? Oh, this much ink has been spilled and many sermons have been given as to the, the profundity that's contained in what seems oftentimes in our books of prophecy and our books of, bi- of, 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 of Scripture to be lackluster, not, not, doesn't seem to add up to anything, doesn't seem to be telling us anything. Okay, for this we have to study. It may not be easy to decode its message, but each and every single word of those scriptures is rife and overflowing with messaging that affects our life today. Either it will be an inspiration for us, it will bring us home to Hashem, or it will teach us the details in halacha that we need. It will tell us what to do and how to do and when to do so that we can properly fulfill the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now the Rambam in, in the seventh chapter of Hilchus Yosei the he opens with a description of the kind of person to whom prophecy would come. And he, he talks about the, the virtues and values of this person, and he says that the prophecy will become one with the person. And there's a, there's a long rumination from the Rebbe where he emphasizes that the Rambam talks about and, and, and Rambam focuses, zeroes in on intelligence. He says it's intelligence and it's consciousness because intelligence becomes a part of your reality. And he says the prophecies would become a part of the reality of the prophet to the point that the prophet's mind would be blown, meaning nothing else could be in his mind. His mind would have room only for the prophecy. And the Ramah goes on to tell us that this is why the phenomenon that surrounded the receiving of prophecy was often one in which the person was blown, in which, in which his limbs became limp, or which a person seemed to have lost his or her marbles altogether doing some of the strangest things. At one point when a prophet is in the midst of receiving his transmission, the people say, what is this madman? What is this lunatic doing amongst us? Because he appears to be a lunatic. Because his mind is taken over by a higher form of consciousness. And he enters into a much deeper and more profound place where he has a different understanding of things and a different vision of things. And the prophet could receive these prophecies for personal spiritual edification. Because he's walking in the ways of prophecies, so Hashem opens his heart and opens his mind and, and fills it with higher consciousness. And what will be the purpose of doing that? First of all, he's serving Hashem on, on a very profound level. Secondly, he has an influence on those around him. When people can speak to a person who is literally in touch with the Creator, this becomes an inspiration for them. So, so that affected the lives of the people around that particular prophet. It doesn't mean that the prophet had messages which were relevant until the end of time. It doesn't mean that the prophet necessarily even had messages that were relevant for the people that were around him. But the people were influenced because they were in the presence of a prophet. And being in the presence of a person who is now in a state of higher consciousness where he knows what God wants him to know in a way that people cannot necessarily makes a difference. 
So this is some of the reasons as to why prophecy once abounded amongst the Jewish people. And it was an extremely common thing. In fact, there were people who the Ramam talks about this in that seventh chapter. He says they were called Bnei Nevi'im, the children of the Nevi'im, but they weren't really the children, they were the disciples of the Nevi'im. They would wear a certain clothing, a certain particular kind of backwards apron, which indicated that they were in that headspace. It was kind of, it was kind of their, uh, a distinctive clothing that set them aside. People say, oh, people would look at the, uh, some people would say, oh, they're Hasidim, they dressed a certain way. And, and they would have certain expectations of these people. And these people boxed themselves in by dressing this way, by acting this way. They, they were living in a, 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 different, a different kind of reality. They were, they were at once part of this world, but really apart, separate from this world. They were not really part of everyday life. And there were millions of people like this. And some of the prophecies could have been directed towards others. Jews and Gentiles. Look, the story of Yonah. He's directed to go to the city of Nineveh. There were no Jews living in Nineveh. Why did he go there? Because God wanted them to tshuva. Why did God want them to tshuva? First of all, good human beings. God wanted his human, the human beings to be re, 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 rehabilitated, redeemed instead of destroyed. But because this was supposed to ultimately be a lesson for the Jewish people, tragically, they did not learn the lesson, which is why Yonah didn't want to go. The point I'm making is, though, that a prophet could be sent on a mission. Now, Yonah's prophecies are relevant for all time, and the reading of Yonah's prophecies in Yom Kippur is considered to be one of the most special readings, especially at the altar of the year. But there could have been many prophets whose names we don't know, the places they lived in are not known to us today, the people they talk to and lives they change are not known to us today. But they were real people, and they had prophecy. The 48 prophets, per se, are the people whom, whose, whose words were recorded, some of whose words, some of whose prophecies were recorded. See, here's the interesting thing. Rashi goes through a whole long list of who were these 48 prophets. He says Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, okay, we know that, Moshe, Aaron, Yoshua, Pinchas. And then he brings proof that Pinchas was a prophet. So whenever we have a prophet that everybody knows and their prophecies are widely known, Rashi will just say a name. When it comes to Pinchas, he brings a proof from the book of Judges that Pinchas was a prophet. And then he says, Vayavi Isha Kim El Eli, who's that? That's Elkanah. So now we know that Elkanah is one of these prophets. Then we have Eli, Shmuel, God, Nasan, David, Shlaime, Ido. But Ido is not a known prophet. So Rashi brings a verse that describes Ido's prophecy. Michio ben Yamla, Bime Achav, Ovadia, Achia Shilaini, Yehu ben Chintzi. Ben Hanani, pardon me, in the days of Asa, Azariah ben Oida, some of these prophets we know, some of these prophets we don't know. In fact, Rashi concludes his comment when he goes through the whole list of prophets by telling you, Vishnayim <laughs> Loyadaiti. I don't know who the other two are, he says. I don't know. There's prophecies attributed to some prophets for posterity, but I don't know what the names are. If Rashi didn't know what the names are, you know, we don't know what the names are. There are others who maintain we do know what the names are and suggest, but I'm sure Rashi knew those things and Rashi still maintains that two we're not sure of. But the point is that these are the prophets, the prophets of whose prophecy things were preserved for posterity. So the shocking truth about prophecy is that prophecy was once a common experience. In fact, higher consciousness was once a common experience. There was a mishora, a spiritual singer, time of David Melch, whose name was Asaf. And Asaf, he sang and composed his spiritual poetry with Ruach HaKodesh, but he's not one of the 48 prophets. So Asaf is, he speaks with Ruach HaKodesh, he speaks with the Holy Spirit. That means there's prophecy and there's halachic designation of what exactly prophecy is and what kind of transmission it is. And then there could have been millions of others who lived with exalted and higher consciousness, which is why we didn't have a Siddur. We didn't have to tell people what to do. They would come to the base of Migdash. They would be in a higher place. They would know how to connect to God. They didn't have to be given a script and tell people, okay, read this or read that. Prayers are very different than the first temple. This is like some people who's a natural salesman. <laughs> you don't have to tell them what to say. They know how to sell. They meet, a, they meet a person. They size them up in two seconds. They know what to say. We know what not to say. They close the deal. And you have people who don't have that gift. They don't know how to do it. So, so, so what do they do? They give them a script. And the script has been worked on by many, many professionals. And they know that which buzzwords, which words make people react and which words make people want to hang the phone up. And these are tried and tested methodologies. And they tell you what kind of voice to speak in. And, and, and they do this. And, you know, 
maybe they have 2% success. But if you made 500 calls a day and you made a few sales, well, at least uh, <laughs> in certain parts of the world, that's actually called a living. But the point is, the point is if you, don't, if you aren't a natural, then you're going to have to use a text and you're going to have to get really good at it. And when people have a text and they work at it and practice, they can get really good at it. That's the idea of getting really good at davening. But in the time of the first place of Migdash, we're talking about millions of prophets. So we're talking, we're talking about tens of millions of people who experienced a higher form of consciousness. They, they didn't be told what to say. They didn't need to be guided. They knew they had to keep the mitzvahs. They kept the mitzvahs very scrupulously, very carefully. But as far as inspiration was concerned, as far as speaking to God was concerned, they were naturals. This came to them organically. But 48 prophets are the ones whose words are still meaningful today. As meaningful as ever, even if it's hard for us to be able to decipher the deeper messages from amongst them. And with that truth about prophecy, we'll now continue along in the Gemara. The Gemara says that there are other ways to understand this verse. Another way to understand this verse is Rabbi Shmuel ben Achmeni Omer Omar Odom Habo Mishte Ramot Shetzofot. He was a person who came from two hilltops, Shetzofot Zu Ezu, who could see one another. So this is the original twin cities. There were, it was a double hilltop city. They were not two separate cities, but the people on one hilltop could see the other hilltop. And of course, Alkana, Shmuel's father, lived in one of them. And then the point is this. Why does it have to say Ramosayim, which is, which is plural? It should say he was in a hill. In a, Ram, in a Rama. Why Rama Sayim? So, so then the, the, the point we're making here is that he actually came from both of, from, 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 from the city which was comprised of hills that could see each other. That's the Rama Sayim. That's why it becomes two hills that comprise a single city. They can overlook or see one the other. Rabchanin Amar, Rabchanin says, Adam haba mi bnei Adam sha'imdim berume shalayla. What's really being told to us here is not just location, even though location is very important. What's really being told to us is pedigree. We're hearing about lineage. We're hearing where all kind of came from, and why he was capable or pre-wired for this kind of greatness. Who are these people? Sha'imdim berume shalayla who occupy the greatest heights. Who stand on the greatest heights? Gemara says, "Wow, Maniu. Who were these people? Who were these amazing people who preceded Alkana and Shmuel? Who did he come from? Bnei Korach, the children of Korach. The children of Korach. Korach, the, the wicked, arrogant, evil man who led a rebellion and mutiny against Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeah, the Chizivit says." The children of Korach, they did not die. And because we emphasize the notion that the children of Korach did not die, so therefore, clearly a miracle must have happened to them. So the question is, what was the miracle that happened? We learned in the name of our Rebbe, but this is not called in, of Rebbe Huda Hanasi, but Rabbeinu means the rabbi, the Rebbe, the teacher of Bavel, who was Rav, not known as, as, as Rebbe, but Rav. That's why it's Mishum Rabbeinu, not Mishum Rebbe. Mishum Rabbeinu in the name of Rav. A high place established itself in hell. And there they stood. And there they stood. Rashi says, Nizbatzer. Nizbatzer, the word Nizbatzer doesn't really mean established, but it comes from the terminology of Gavoya. A high place was established. A high place. For example, in the book of Deuteronomy, we hear of the Jewish people coming into the land of Israel and encountering skyscrapers, well, of the day. These tall towers that were built for purposes of defense. Bitsura is Bashamayim, skyscrapers, built high up into the heavens, high up into the clouds. In other words, that the children of Korach didn't die, and the children of Korach later went on to live to live lives and they had children and those children had children and that's where Elkanah and ultimately Shmuel comes from so actually this is a, a pasuk 
It's a pasuk. It's a verse that's found in the book of Numbers, in Parshas Pinchas. In chapter 26, in verse 11, it says, Ubnei Kairach Mesu. The children of Kairach didn't die. So Rashi tells us something very interesting. They were the ones who had this idea to go and push their father into this ridiculous mutiny against Moshe Rabbeinu. But when the, the, the dispute spun out of control, they start to feel really bad about this. They had a deep sense of regret and they didn't realize it would go like this. They didn't realize it would, it would, it would spin out of control and become such a huge fight. Because they had feelings of tshuva in their heart, when everybody was swallowed up by the earth and everybody went to Gehenna, they also went to Gehenna. But they had a high place established for them and there they remained. Now the Pasuk of Bnei Kerech Lemesu only shows up at the end of the 40 years. The mutiny of Kerech is in the beginning of the 40 years. And if this happened, why don't we hear about it in Parshas Korach? Why is it we only told about it in Parshas Pinchas? So the Rebbe says an amazing thing. Rashi answers this question by telling you the Bnei Korach's tshuva was only in their hearts. Hirharu tshuva, they did tshuva, but they did tshuva in their heart. And because it was only belibam, superficially, what everybody else saw was people involved in the dispute. And because of this, they got swallowed up with the rest of Korach's people. They deserved to be swallowed up. What everybody saw from what everybody could appreciate, Korach's children, who were part of the mutiny, got punished as well. And therefore, the Rebbe says, when you go back to Pasha's Kerach, it says, Vayevdu mitoich hakohol. It doesn't say they were lost. They were lost from amidst the people. The people thought they were lost. They thought the Bnei Korach were gone, but they weren't. And what happened is, not all of Korach's people were fully destroyed. Some of them, namely his children, were only lost from the vision of those around them. It looked like they were gone and lost forever, but they really weren't. And that's why in Parshas Kerach it doesn't say B'nai Kerach Le Mesu, because in Parshas Kerach they thought B'nai Kerach Mesu. They were swallowed up in the ground just like everybody else. And they weren't aware of it. And they only became aware of it after Kolu Mesi Midbar, after those who were destined to die in the desert had all finished dying. And here we are now in the final approach to the land of Israel. And the last ones who are left, these are the ones, so to speak, who were able to see the Bnei Korach, that they emerged in their place. That's when the punishment of Korach's people came to an end because the people who saw them, who were part of this machlok, is no longer alive. As the Divrei David, the Taz says, Ezezman hoyu begehenim, they spent time in Gehenim, v'achakach yotzwa pnei ha'aretz, and only later did they reemerge and join the rest of the people that Rebbe maintains that they remained in Gehenim for 39 years. From the time of the machlokes of Korach all the way until the Mesa Hamidbar had died, and then they reemerged when Moshe Rabbeinu began to count the people in the final months leading up to the entry into Eretz Yisrael. At the end of the forty years, that's when the Bnei Kerech reappeared. So these are this is a <laughs> quite interesting people. There's an opinion that the Lam Natsayach live Bnei Kerech Mizmer that the Psalms that are attributed to the children of Korach were actually songs of longing and spirituality that were composed in Gehenna, in the hell that they were in in this high place that was established for them. So what we're really hearing about is something extraordinary. We're hearing about the power of tshuva. The power of tshuva that even if somebody is part of something very bad, like a mutiny against Moshe, ultimately, if there's a feeling of tshuva, even if it's only in the heart, it established this high place. And this is alluded to with the idea that Shmuel's father came from Ramasayim Tzoyfim, from two high hills, which really indicate the notion of they come from the, no, the notion of Ramais, people who stood in Rumai Shalalam at the highest part, and the highest part here perhaps could be understood not only the notion of a high part in Gehenim, but it says, in a place with, with Balit Shuva stand, even full tzaddikim can stand. So they occupied a very, very high space. And in that high space where they were, that's where they were able to, to be saved and ultimately rejoin the Jewish people. 
Now, the interesting thing is that um, the, the Rashbam, the Rashba, pardon me, has like a whole discussion about this, and he says that the, 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 there was a possibility that when the ground opened up, there was like a portion of ground in which they were still standing. It's almost like this like a sliver of ground, like you see sometimes when the high tide comes in, and you see it, these tiny little islands, which you can see off the seashore are actually long projectiles of, 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 of earth. Like literally, they had like, this platform in the middle, middle of the earth. Of course, the problem with it is that it, it doesn't answer this idea of where they were for 40 years. And it says, Mokon is Batsa big Gehenim. From the Rashmas way of looking at it, it doesn't answer that, that question at all. And therefore, the way the other Mepharshim explained it, the idea the way the Rebbe takes it is, they actually did go down into the ground. And they were Yevedu Matech HaKahol. But ultimately, Mokim this Batzalahem, and from there they did Tshuva, saying Moshe Emes, Beteirase Emes. And in the end, they merited to have some of the greatest Sadikim of all time descend from them, Alkana, and ultimately Shmuel Hanavi, who appoint, anoints Shaul HaMelech as a, a temporary king, whose job is to safeguard the kingdom, and that evolves ultimately into the Malchus of David HaMelech. And from there, Emir Hashem will come. The Mashiach, who is a descendant of David, the Mehira, will be Amenu. Amen. And with this, we will break for today. <laughs>